Welcome. I'm Karen Tucker, and this morning's Churchill Club program is called Innovation's Endless Revolution. Over the last few decades, we've seen unprecedented innovation. And much of the technology that has changed our world in so many ways has originated right here in Silicon Valley. And because we are at ground zero of this vast revolution, it might be tempting to think that the pattern of innovation will continue in the years to come. But will it? And if it does, will it continue at the same frenetic pace? We have Vijay Vaithiswaran and Paul Sappho here to discuss this meaty topic this morning. Thank you very much for being here, gentlemen. And our thanks also goes to Citrix Systems for hosting us in their beautiful conference facility. We hope you'll join us for our next program next Thursday, April 5th, as we present Fortune Magazine's senior editor-at-large, Adam Lashinsky, and respected Stanford Business School professor Bob Sutton, and they're going to talk about leadership and innovation the Apple way. For details about this, you can always go to our website or find out how you can get more involved with the Churchill Club at churchillclub.org. And then finally, if you are tweeting, please use the hashtag Churchill Club, and you'll find other Twitter codes in your printed program. BJ Vaithiswaran is an award-winning global correspondent and the China Business and Finance Editor for The Economist. He is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and he's an advisor to the World Economic Forum and an adjunct faculty member at New York University's Stern School of Business. And he is also the author of three books, including the brand new Need, Speed, and Greed. Paul Sappho is a world-renowned forecaster and leading authority on the dynamics of large-scale long-term change. Paul is Managing Director of Foresight at Discern Analytics, where he is a, and he also teaches at Stanford University, where he is a consulting associate professor. Please give your warmest Churchill Club welcome to Vijay and Paul. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Vijay. This good. is a real treat for me. I've known Vijay for some time, and he's uh, your official title these days is Global Correspondent, correct? Uh, I've just recently I become our, our China you're... China business and finance editor, but I but I am a, a global citizen. Let's put it that way. So, right. and VJ is very much one of us. In addition to being a brilliant, uh, brilliant writer and editor, he also uh, has the startup gene in him. He's opening up the, the Shanghai office for uh, the Economist, and and I think almost your first assignment at the Economist was opening up the Mexico City bureau. So. He's definitely one of us, and I'm hoping after today's breakfast he'll change his plans and decide that he should really stay in Silicon Valley <laughs> and start a company. Um, so as Karen mentioned, the, the title of this, oh, sorry. Uh, okay, let's see. How's that? Oh, my God. Uh, Very different. I'm going to whisper until they put the volume down and back. Let's see. Yep. There he goes. He's just about to hit the equalizer. Uh, much better. Okay. Sorry. Uh, I'll figure out this technology stuff eventually. <laughs> um, so the title of this morning is Innovation's Endless Revolution. And we consciously borrowed the title uh, as, as a tip of the hat, a bowler, of course, since this is the Churchill Club, uh, to Vinivar Bush's famous report in 1945, Science Endless Frontiers. And that was a moment in time. World War II had ended. There, the, 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 the Allies seemed triumphant. It was a horizon of seemingly infinite possibility, and yet also high uncertainty. And, and a great national agenda began around that, saying, how can we organize science and technology in a way to continue the good things that happened from R&D during World War II? We're now at a moment that's similar to that. I think it's another 1945 moment on the planet where the planet is facing astounding challenges. And at the same time, there's been some amazing new innovations and the like. And there's a real, I think, a real sense that innovation is what's going to save us. Do you think that's a fair statement, Vijay? I think it's always been a great race, Paul. I think um, you're right to give that 
a broader sweep of history as a frame. Um, but historically, development has been a great race between, for example, the forces of economic progress, uh, of economic growth, poverty alleviation, uh, the aspirations of a good life, all of those things that um, I think every one of us cherishes, and that increasingly the bottom billion and the uh, middle billions are arriving at in China, India, and Brazil with re at record pace. What's happening in economic terms is not just once in a lifetime, but I would argue perhaps that the biggest economic phenomenon in 500 years since the arrival of Columbus on these American shores sparked that extraordinary age of globalization that we saw. But that other side of that coin, the other part of the great race, is ecological destruction, um, uh, species loss, that um, uh, atmospheric pollution, that there's always been a race between development and degradation. And the key variable, in my view, has been innovation. Uh, those who looked at the world with a static mindset, any time, in any point in time, you could really look at pollution levels or you, you pick the indicator, population growth, and say, this is completely unsustainable. This is good. The population's a bomb that, um, you know, the, we're going to run out of atmosphere. We're going to run out of fresh water. And all of those trends, trend lines are powerful. And had we stuck with business as usual, it would have been disaster. And there are local disasters all the time. But if you look at things globally and if you see development as a dynamic dance, and, and that race, as I say, is not uh, preordained, doesn't mean we're going to win the race. But as long as we continue to innovate and continue to reward innovators that work on socially important problems, and that's where the greed in my book title, and I will get to in a, in a bit, I think that's the key where innovation plays well, that role. But I want to pause right at innovation. That you know, Marshall McLuhan famously observed, I don't know who discovered water, but it was not a fish. No. And here in Silicon Valley, we swim in innovation. Uh, and yet I don't think we often really pause to step back and ask, what exactly is innovation? And you have a marvelous definition of innovation. And distinguish it from invention. Sure, you bet. I, I think uh, innovation is the most abused word in the English language, right? I mean, especially in this room. Who's against innovation? Raise your hand. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, and so what are we talking about? You know how you can be in a conference room or a boardroom and everyone agrees on some sort of innovation plan. Then you find out six months later, people actually meant slightly different things. And, um, and so I start by saying innovation is not invention. And uh, you know, these may be fighting words here in the heart of Silicon Valley, but uh, innovation is not primarily about technology. Uh, innovation is not about IP or patents or PhDs, uh, even though it's often conflated with these things. Uh, in my view, innovation is fresh thinking that creates value. And that fresh thinking may or may not involve new technology, uh, but it almost certainly has to involve that creation of value. And almost certainly, creating value is the harder part of the equation, not coming up with the novel technology. In fact, it can be old technology. If I can give one small example, Paul, if you'll Please. indulge me. From history, um, you know, back in 1860s, there was an energy crisis in America. But it may not be the one you're thinking of. There was a lighting crisis. The whalers from my native Connecticut had managed to kill off most of the world's whales, so there wasn't enough blubber to light the lanterns of New England. And there was a quest that was on to find the next source of lighting fuel. And they had known uh, through rumors that the rock oil, as they call it in Pennsylvania, had been used by the Native Americans for, for lighting. And so a group of investors from New Haven said, let's see if we can make this economic. And they sent a very shady guy by the name of Colonel Drake he wasn't really a colonel, and he was a huckster in various ways, but he was clever. And they said, Colonel, go find us a way to get this rock oil to market. Months later, after spending all their money, they sent a letter saying, Colonel, we give up. The money's gone. That last day, facing sort of uh, the end of the, the gravy train, he sat on his porch sipping lemonade, and he said, he remembered from his history books that the Chinese used to drill for salt, many centuries of this. And he said, hmm, let me try that. It wasn't new technology, but you can see how in that context, and you know where the story ends, he had a magnificent gusher and transformed not only the lighting industry, but created enormous value for his shareholders, for society, it was the birth of an industry that ultimately led to an unanticipated serendipitous industry, which of course is the arrival of uh, the internal combustion engine and the, the iron nexus with gasoline that powered 20th century American greatness all because of that innovation, I would say, that involved no new technology. And in, in eerie parallels to today, uh, I recently uh, <coughs> been 
happened across a brochure from 1905 on how to use acetylene to light your house. Now, how many people this morning woke up and said, my life is complete, incomplete with, without a, a carbide acetylene generator in the basement? And this was union carbide. I sort of like Solyndra. Um, uh, sorry, I was a cheap shot. Uh, but uh, you know, at this moment in time where we're doing all these innovations and it's very far from clear which energy mix is going to succeed and not. True. So um, but I forgot one detail. Questions from the audience. We're not going to save questions till the end. Here's how it works. If you have a question, and, and all I ask is that you try and make, for this first two or 30 minutes, make the question um, uh, relevant to what's actually being discussed at that particular moment. If you have a <laughs> That's question. That's asking a lot, Paul. I know. It's not a rule I never follow. Um, <laughs> you raise your hand. If you have a comment or a question that absolutely must be uh, injected into the conversation at that very moment, do this. <laughs> Raise two hands, we'll bring everything to a stop, and we'll get a mic right over to you. So, you know, please join, join the conversation in here. Um, Silicon Valley, mm. does it have a future? Gosh, what do you guys think? <laughs> no, uh, who's nervous about the Valley's prospects over the next 10 years? Just show of hands. Don't be shy. Let's get these hands up high here. One, the president of the club, two, three, four, five. Okay. Who is absolutely bullish, like no problem, we're just going to charge on? It's about, oh, hold on, keep your hands no, up. No, it's, got to, it's about 20%. And who's not sure? And who hasn't raised their hand? <laughs> OK, good. So it's, a, it's an optimistic audience, not it quite is. bullish. But. It is. Uh, can I ask one of the pessimists just to give us a, a reason why? Let's ask Avery. Mike to Avery. I worry because the billion dollar companies aren't being created in the US anymore. A decade ago, 50% of them were in the US. It's now 15%. Give an example of what worries you. Oh. The, if you're the largest steel company in the world is a company that, you know, two of them, one of them is Chinese, one of them is Indian, you never even heard their names, right? What's Baoshan and Mittal? Arcel Mittal and then H, um, HBI, it's a Chinese company that yeah. you probably know, that yeah. you can't even find their website, but they're the largest producer, producer of steel in the world. Yet, this worries me, not, not so much steel, mind you, but that the fact that the billion dollar high growth companies are Chinese and Indian, they're not US. Well, well let's talk about this a little bit. If I, uh, I don't want to derail uh, the master no, plan, Paul. But um, no, the, uh, having covered business and finance and technology for 20 years for The Economist, much of it outside of the US, and of course now I'm in China, um, spearheading our expansion in China, this is something that is right at the cutting edge of what I report on. And I think what you say, um, is true, but also I may not um, share uh, the pessimism, or at least the concern that you express. Um, I think you know we're, we're no longer in a unipolar moment, right? That's been true in foreign policy, but it's also true in economics. Uh, that the U.S. is not going to be the the originator of all great things for the world and the beneficiary of all great things, right? But that um, uh, just because uh, China up doesn't have to mean America down, right? Um, and so. Uh, it, it, China may have billion dollar industries, but let's ask about what the nature of that industry is, right? Um, the Chinese economy fundamentally uh, is driven by uh, state direction, fundamentally driven by subsidized capital, uh, which in effect is um, coerced from savers. Uh, Chinese households are paid a very low rate of interest on their savings, uh, and that uh, capital is subsidized, pushed through a state controlled financial system to state preferred industries, national champions. Um, and that is effective in an in industrial model of production. If you talk about steels, car making, you know, large scale replicable things, uh, in an age of cheap China, that really worked well. You can scale, you have a lot of effects in the supply chain. But if we're talking about Silicon Valley strengths, uh, there's something else here. And when we're talking about the American economy, it's a, uh, we're already in the post-industrial economy in America more than any other large economy on Earth, more than any other OECD economy, we are living in the ideas economy, I would argue. Almost 80% of US GDP comes not from use of brawn, but from use of brain. 
that's a higher proportion than Europe or Japan, for example. And in that kind of economy, um, the Chinese approach of, again, picking state champions, directing capital to politically connected companies, uh, that's not a peer competitor. They may be able to grow, but as long as the pie grows, we can both grow, I would argue. And I would say America's continuing strength will have to be on uh, creating the industries of the future. Uh, and China may come along and scale them, but they will also benefit but it doesn't have to be at our expense as long as we continue to innovate, continue to do what Silicon Valley has famously done very well in the past. I think, uh, so I don't think one has to be proof positive of the other's decline. So it's not a zero sum game. However, I wanna pick up on, on Avery's comment here. You know, we're all celebrating the vast success of, of Apple and the I everything world. Um, but you and I were talking recently about low-cost manufacturing globally, and, and, and you did the, a marvelous issue in The Economist where we said it was the end of cheap China. Hmm. But that doesn't mean manufacturing is going to go somewhere else because this isn't about cheap labor. It's about the manufacturing networks, the fact that the people making the glass for the screen are down the street, and right. you have all those networks in place. Silicon Valley, at some level, has hollowed out its networks. I mean, Steve Wozniak worked at a summer job at Hewlett-Packard before he started at Apple. And there are all sorts of folks in Silicon Valley in the older generation who started out working on a piece of manufacturing or something else. You know, Apple makes nothing in Silicon Valley physical. And so all those engineers who might go on to other jobs who start by doing physical engineering, they aren't here. They're in China. Is that a threat to Silicon Valley? that we don't have local engineers here working up the food chain? No, I think um, the US can do better. Germany does better on this count, for example, in terms of having um, a greater proportion of its GDP come from high-end manufacturing. But we're not going to, Foxconn's knowing, not gonna move to Silicon Valley, guys. Let's just be honest, right? There's some manufacturing jobs that aren't gonna come back. Well, but the point we have is, to, right? and the, and point the supplier is, networks that are needed. Your point was more nuanced, obviously, yeah, right? The, we don't have engineers making things in the valley in but, manufacturing. But if the basis is to compete against the Foxcons of the world at scale, at extremely low price, that ain't gonna happen here, right? So if the argument is, we should be doing that, you know, I'm sorry to be the, the, you know, the damp squib here, but that's not going to happen here. We can't compete on cost. Uh, but there are, there are other models of competition, including in manufacturing, especially as you move towards a world where manufacturing itself is being reinvented, in part because of technologies that are being invented here in America and in California, whether it's 3D printing, whether it's, you know, again, a very sophisticated uh, CAD CAM and advanced design that's declining rapidly in price. If we reimagine what manufacturing means and, and also build a technical base for it, where we, are, we have done very poorly in keeping the technical education piece of this. Um, again, here, Germany does a better job of this sure. with its supply chain, with technical education, with almost a guild system for making sure it's not just PhDs, but you have people of all technical capacities um, uh, up, up and down the food chain. We can do better, but let's not think that we're going to be doing the bottom end manufacturing jobs. It ain't going to happen. I'm not, yeah, I'm not saying that, but we'll get back to education. We have a couple of questions. So I, there's a mic already here, and then I, I need to send one over here. So, sir, just shout. Uh, my name is Rajiv. Um, I work for Tele Innovations. We're an IP company. Um, I'm wondering if you have a thought on how uh, maybe Moore's Law is not going to so much end as we're going to get priced out of it uh, because the cost of going to new uh, semiconductor manufacturing nodes is so high. And so I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm from the camp of people who are concerned about the future of Silicon Valley, even I you asked for the show of hands. Um, so I, I'm, I'm wondering if companies like Intel and AMD that have been the bedrock of Silicon Valley for so many years may have to go into a different business model. And, and if so, would we have to name, uh, change our name from Silicon Valley to something else? So you're familiar with Moore's second law. You know, Moore's, Moore's first law is the you know the right. price performance of, of chips. Moore's second law is the cost of fabs, and they're depending on some charts you look at it. It goes to infinity faster than the chip. So, what do you think about that? Is, well, is there a silicon in Silicon Valley's future? Well, actually, I would turn it to you, Paul, as as a guru at Singularity University, which is committed to the notion of 
technology is at the knee of that grow, exponential growth path, not just a range of exponential growth, but the convergence of these technologies. Um, give us a forecast. Well, I may teach at Singularity University. That doesn't mean I believe in the singularity. Um, and in fact, a mi minority of the students who attend actually buy in singularity. Uh, the only thing I would say to your question, I, you know, to me, the secret of Silicon Valley is that we know how to fail better than anybody else. That failure is embedded in our DNA. We know how to fail in the right way. And it, it has to do with sort of the myth that came around. And in fact, it's built into our architecture. I mean, there is a reason why most of our buildings are two stories high and surrounded by grass. So <laughs> that when people jump, they just sprain their ankle and, you know, and they're at home and they put ice up on their leg and they realize they have a half-finished business plan. That, that, you know, uh, Mike Murphy famously said, uh, Silicon Valley is a place that eats its old. So we have a disrespect, intrinsic disrespect, and, and unlike Route 128, which honored its old. Uh, so I actually see companies like Intel and, and AMD fleeing into the future themselves, trying to, trying to change that model. And beneath it, the good news is Moore's Law, you know, it, it's continuing. There's, we, we see no slowdown in it, but we're going to have to ship to different materials, would be my take. Uh, there, there was a hand over here that I know first. Great. Okay. I, I wanted to get back to BJ's um, comment about manufacturing to your question. An example uh, uh, to reinforce your point would be Tesla. Mm -hmm. They're manufacturing here. Now, maybe one might argue this isn't necessarily a rebirth of automobile manufacturing in the U.S., but they are pioneering something, how to manufacture electric vehicles with the new, ve the new vehicle they're doing that they designed from the ground up part and parcel to them was we had to know how to build it and know everything intimately about it. That's happening right here in Fremont. Right. Let me give another example, a concrete example. Um, the, um, uh, two Fridays ago, I was uh, on Capitol Hill uh, with representatives of uh, a dozen of the leading scientific societies, including, for example, the American, uh, uh, the, the AAAS, uh, Academy for the Advancement of Sciences. Uh, and we were making the argument they asked me to moderate a panel on both sides of the House and the Senate, making the case for continuing to invest in federal R&D uh, and for more effective spending on F uh, federal R&D, as well as encouragement of the corporate sector to spend on R&D, even though we're obviously in difficult financial times in terms of the federal budget. Um, and I agreed to do this for the following reason. You know, I'm a free market guy, as perhaps many of you are in this room. I'm, I'm an economist guy. I believe in markets. I believe, uh, but I also believe that there is a carefully circumscribed role for government in, in helping drive the enablers of future innovation. Uh, and that's what sometimes uh, laissez-faire folks forget. And among the few things that government has to do, uh, whether it's investment in education, uh, and encouragement of the right kinds of infrastructure, but certainly lots of evidence from the economic literature shows investment in R&D, especially of the sorts the private sector won't do, um, is, is a valuable thing to do. Great companies invest in a downturn, so should great countries, is my argument. Need to cut in a time of difficulties, cut entitlement programs, cut defense, don't cut to the bone on things that will enable future productivity growth and, the, and the, fill the pipeline for future innovation, right? And I give this example because one of the people who was there with me, uh, one of the scientists and experts, uh, was from Dow. And she explained how, for example, in Michigan, uh, thanks to technology that they've developed, for integrating uh, solar panels right into the shingles of roofs um, so that the shingle has solar integrated uh, panels and connects in a, almost in a Lego-like way. Um, uh, this technology has been a few years coming. Some of you will know it's old hat. But the point is it's commercial. But, and they decided to build the manufacturing plant in Michigan, close to market, have their engineers at hand. And that's a kind of example of how we can think about uh, where could manufacturing go. And it's not because they're getting subsidies to build a manufacturing plant there or uh, you know, some other kind of distortion of the marketplace. It makes sense for them to put their engineers and their manufacturing close to the market where they're going to sell the product. And that's an example of how we can think about uh, what kind of engineering and jobs and manufacturing jobs might actually come back here. We need to think about not making the cheap and cheerful products at the bottom of the end, but you know, how do we build the cutting edge products? And I mean, with that in mind, you and I earlier this week had a conversation about two critical technologies, robotics and 3D printing. And it feels like the convergence of those two things is a revolution tiptoeing into our presence. Mm. And the notion that reshoring or onshoring of manufacturing, some kinds of manufacturing. So, you know, first technology enabled us to offshore. Now the manufacturing, in some instances, is coming back to the U.S. 
uh, but, but not necessarily to humans. It's coming back to robots and 3D printing, where the new imperative is to have the production of the product close to the ultimate consumer and also close to your R&D. How fast do you see that growing? Well, I think that, that's getting a big push, um, in part because the economics of uh, the world's workshop itself is changing. Uh, that is, China, um, you know, one of the uh, pieces the piece that Paul alluded to a few weeks ago in The Economist that I wrote that got some, uh, you know, some sort of a, a reaction, let's say, in the, <laughs> out there in the world of ideas, um, uh, was I predicted that we are at the end of cheap China. After many years of people sort of looking at it, is it happening, is it not? Um, and, and I did a lot of reporting with companies on the ground, um, supply chain managers, guys who actually make the decisions, whether it's small, fast fashion uh, companies or shoe chains or the big GEs and multinationals uh, on the ground, and Chinese companies like Huawei, et cetera. And bottom line is, uh, such have been the increases, not only in, co in labor costs, but also benefits, the burden of regulations along the coastal provinces of China double-digit levels over the last five years and with no end in sight that um, that and we, we just saw of course Foxconn raise wages by 25 percent as a part of the new report just released they're going to go up even more across the board in that area some people say oh come on they're just going to uh, all this stuff is just going to move to Vietnam right you, you've heard that story Vietnam is the next China or, or they'll just move to the interior of China there's another 500 million poor people there that's actually where I think um, the argument falls apart Vietnam is not the new China, nor is Indonesia, yet, nor is India. Um, none of these places have the supply chain. Uh, none, and many companies have looked at this. They've even done it. Probably many of you in this room have had a China plus one strategy. And you see that worker productivity isn't there. You don't have the supple and nimble supply chain that you need. Uh, and China continues to be productive. Workers are productivity gains. When you move in the interior provinces, your supply chain has to truck everything in. Logistics are so terrible, uh, going from the interior provinces to Shanghai, costs more than shipping from Shanghai to New York. And again, I see a lot of heads nodding around the room. So the world is uh, this the end of cheap China, but we're going to be stuck with expensive China. That's my argument. It's not going to go in the interior or go to Vietnam. This means that the stuff we buy at Walmart, it's going to cost a few bucks more. All right, let's be honest. Uh, but we could probably stomach that small contribution to inflation. The bigger uh, gain, though, and the relevant point to your conversation, is this makes it possible for companies to imagine that they're not that they're going to move plants to the Midwest. That's not going to happen. But the next plant a multinational builds, the economics look a lot better. To come to do a comparison point, if you project these trends out in the coastal regions of China for the next three, four, five years, and you're doing a forward planning for your next manufacturing facility, especially if you're going to be integrating uh, some of the advanced manufacturing techniques, the numbers look a lot better to think about the United States as a place, especially if a lot of your customers are going to be in the U.S. Let's not forget the supply chain risk as well. We saw that with the Icelandic volcano and the Japanese tsunami. Um, if you add in a small insurance premium for keeping supplies closer to home, the economics look a lot better. So I think the idea of a manufacturing renaissance is, in the U.S. is even possible as long as we're careful about what we mean by manufacturing. It isn't going to be the bottom end jobs, but it might be a different kind of return of manufacturing. Well, we forget. The United States still accounts for 25% 20 of the world's manufacturing. That's right. Goods. But I, I look at 3D and robotics is not just pulling back some jobs or some manufacturers overseas. For us in Silicon Valley, that nexus is an opportunity for completely new kinds of products and completely new kinds of customer experiences. So uh, there's one question here. Uh, sir, it's been a while. So I think the conversation is already heading this way. My name is Jonathan, by the way. Um, what I'm curious to know is when you look at the future of Silicon Valley, which we talked about earlier, and the future of manufacturing and innovation and so on, could you tie that back to us, for us, to the themes of your new book? Because I'm very interested in what you've already put on paper, which I haven't read yet, and how it relates to the conversation that's underway here. Great. And thank you. I promise I didn't plant this gentleman in the audience. He's, uh, but, but thank you for so asking. Let's, let's do this. Let's sure, sure. talk about need first, sure. and then we'll shift to speed, and we'll end up on my favorite subject, greed. Um, so <laughs> Absolutely. a little bit about need. Absolutely. So um, uh, when I... You know, when I talk about need, uh, I do believe that we're actually entering a much more perilous time in the global economy, um, and that um, the, the wicked problems that we face now uh, are ones that we have not yet begun to come to grips with. Uh, if we look at uh, what problems America has been working on, uh, the global problems, uh, since 9-11, we've been working on the war on terror, which has taken up a lot of our um, uh, capacity in Washington, and we've been working on dealing with the financial mess, the crisis in capitalism. 
first after Enron and then, of course, after Lehman Brothers. These are important problems. They deserve our attention. My argument is, from the perspective of 2050 or 2100, we're not going to be judged on how we handle these problems. These are the easy problems. Uh, political terrorism has been with humanity for over a thousand years. It's not a novel problem, nor, in fact, is crisis in capitalism. Tell me when there wasn't a crisis in capitalism, right? If you go back to the tulip bubble or the South Sea manias, crisis and capitalism go hand in hand. Every generation has to deal with this. What's new and different and much more powerful and much more difficult are the things that are related to the mega trends of our age. And if you look at you know well understood rise of not just China, India, and the BRICS economies, but the civets economies behind them, you know, Colombia, Indonesia, Turkey, and then an acronym that ha the next few acronyms that are going to come up, we haven't made them up yet. Um, we're living at an interesting and important time in economic history. Again, I argue the most powerful economic change in, in if not generations, in 500 years, where a billion people have already been lifted out of poverty in one generation, which is extraordinary. Another billion may happen in the next generation with luck. And that is good just from the perspective of the human condition. It's a great time to be alive. But it also brings those minds and markets to the global economy, making it better for us as well. So I really do think the zero-sum notion of innovation or global innovation has to be roundly debunked, whatever our politicians tell us. Right? This is a great time. But it puts pressure on resources. And we know this. The food, water, energy nexus, as it's been called, fresh water, uh, the, the quest for oil, these are going to be very difficult challenges. Uh, the, the consequences of climate change, for example, as these economies rise. And if they, everyone in China wants to live like Americans, we're screwed. You know, this is not possible, right? It's, even America can't live like Americans going into the future, right? We have to find a better way of living if we're going to manage our, um, that great race I talked about between development and degradation. Um, another one of these problems is, in some sense, the, the flip side of globalization and Googleization. That is, the hyperconnectivity of the world means that we are living in a deadly age of pandemics. It is much, and I used to be our healthcare correspondent, and I covered this from the front lines. It is, it is scary when you talk to the leading uh, viro virologists and experts at WHO or CDC and see how ill prepared we were uh, for the H1N1 virus. But we happened to dodge a bullet on that one. But it's not because of anything we did, not because we were prepared, not because our vaccine manufacturing was ready. So I say all this by way of saying... Well, and actually on H H1N, there is the, uh, the key innovator in that was Singapore. How so? It turned out that the, uh, the, the temperature sensors that were put into the airports uh, all came out of a Singapore uh, military R&D project for detecting people hidden in jungles. And generally not known, Singapore spends more per capita on military R&D than the United States does. And uh, Singapore being Singapore, they pivoted like that, mm. threw them into the airports, spread it around, and it helped make a difference. Well, this is why I hang around Paul. He's a lot smarter than me. Uh, it's so not true. But I want to I take this down sure. a, a level. Cause th well, just, just, just to put a okay. fine point on the a point I need, um, you know, we live at a, in an age of extraordinary difficulties at, and, and risks, but I do believe that means it cries out for better ways of doing innovation, of accelerating the pace of global innovation, and whether it's to deal with the global problems, the middle class squeeze, which I really think is fundamentally about people being left out of the innovation race. It's not fundamentally a taxation policy question out of Washington, because you see this across OECD economies, even Scandinavian ones that have better quote unquote tax policies than we do you see that uh, middle classes are being squeezed. So I really think that there's a, a desperate need for better, more ambitious innovation. So better ways of doing innovation. Earlier this week, you and I were together, and there was a conversation about reverse innovation. Mm. And I think this is news we can use here in Silicon Valley, that there are other models of innovation. And um, uh, another VJ, VJ Govindarajan, at uh, the Tuck School mm -hmm. is working on it. Just say a little bit about reverse innovation and give some examples, because I think this is a really important concept for us here in the Valley. Sure. Um, one of the things that's different about how innovation works now, and part of the speed part of my thesis, is that innovation itself is being innovated. That is meta-innovation. The rules of innovation are changing very rapidly. Um, and one of the ways that they're changing, and re part of the reason they're changing, is that um, innovation is becoming much more democratic as you move towards more open, networked, interconnected, user-generated models of innovation. 
the traditional silos that we're familiar with, you know, Xerox Park up the road or AT&T Bell Labs or um, the many other wonderful secretive IP-driven ways of doing invention are becoming less important. Not that they're going to vanish, they're not, um, but I think many of you know that um, as Bill Joy proclaimed some years ago, BJ, the smartest people don't live here. BJ, if yeah. you don't tell them what reverse innovation is, I'm reversing immediately, into it. I'm going to tell them. I'm so. reversing into it. So. I know you are, but I want you to get to the point because I only got 20 minutes left here. So the best ideas are not coming from inside your corporate labs. They might be coming from um, a village in Kenya where uh, a, a, a participant in that local economy now has mobile phone banking thanks to M-Pesa something I don't have in New York with my money center bank that got a bailout and is too big to fail. I'm thinking, what the heck's going on here, right? That is, people uh, that are not traditionally part of the innovation ecosystem, that's why I belabor the point, because we're all elites here, right? Let's just be honest. We're here at the heart of World Innovation Central. It's easy to think that the smartest people are in this room or in your company or just down the road. And when you look actually at innovations in medical um, technology coming out of China, uh, you're seeing disruptive medical innovators coming up with medical devices that are a fraction of the price that the big boys, Philips or Medtronic or GE, are coming up with that are not just cheap and cheerful. That used to be the old way of thinking about this, to your point, Paul, uh, that, oh, you know, you put a few duct tape around it and get it out there, it's good enough for the poor world. They're actually cheaper and better. Prosthetics, for example, that cost let's a fraction about, of the price. Let's talk specifically about the Thai prosthetics. Sure. Good this story. One example, here. right? Um, a U.S. trained doctor went back to Thailand and said, look, you know, a prosthetic leg costs, what, $20,000 in the U.S., uh, full cost. He said, there's no way my countrymen can afford this. So he designed, using advanced materials, a better prosthetic leg than available generally in the U.S. It had to be better because in the U.S. you get a prosthetic leg, you usually have flat surfaces and, you know, you're, you don't have to worry. In Thailand, people walk, especially in rural areas, barefoot, uneven surfaces, they sit cross-legged. So the demands are greater. It forced ingenuity. So he came up with a, a, something that costs less than 50 bucks and is um, serviceable. In fact, is a success in the marketplace. And he even just to, you know, sort of add a, maybe a bit of marketing flair oh, to it. Oh, come on. Baby can tell the come on. Tell, baby, tell a story. There's a, a baby elephant that went into Burma, uh, across the border into Burma and, and, and hit a landmine, lost a leg. He made a, an affordable prosthetic for a little baby Moshe. And, of course, it's the best marketing story ever. And, but, and it's a very happy elephant. It's a very happy elephant. That's right. <laughs> So, but these are the kinds of examples that are not just one off, but one after the other after the other. Um, well, but this is important for the Valley because the Valley, we don't just innovate, we keep innovating in the ways we innovate. The way the Valley works today is very different than it was even 10 years ago. And these are examples we should be going out and chasing down the examples of innovation abroad and bringing them back here, no? Bringing them back here is the key, and this is actually a point I drill down deeply in this book with lots and lots of specific examples inside companies. Um, even though now, when I, when I say that, many of you already were nodding your heads, you know about sort of frugal engineering and these ideas coming up. Maybe um, many of you have labs in India or China or Brazil, and your guys there are, are, are kind of working on a pace, a metabolism of innovation that doesn't always follow the rules, right? Um, that's great. You get it. But let me give you a real-world example, sticking with Paul's admonition to be concrete, um, of how hard it is to actually bring back to this market. GE, for example, is a company that um, now gets it, right? Um, they have labs in, in these countries. They even come up with um, uh, disruptive innovations there. And, you know, I sat down with Jeff Immel uh, for this book and actually um, challenged him because I happen to know that some of the cheaper, more cheerful, more affordable devices that, that come out of their labs in China, the, the researchers there, because I'd gone and talked to them, they said, the headquarters wasn't supportive. They said, this isn't the GE way. This isn't good enough. In other words, it isn't what medical invention is typically, which is a lot more expensive, gold-plated, uh, just a little bit better. That's what in medical devices it tended to be. But they did it anyway. They did an end run. And they, they said, well, let's talk to our colleagues in other emerging markets. Turned out the Brazilian market, they were really interested. So they found a way around the system. But I said, wait a minute, why can't we have this in the US? Where 20% of GDP almost goes into healthcare. And the story goes, briefly like this. Um, the head of healthcare at the time, actually Omar Ishraq, um, said, let me try to bring this back to the U.S., some of the more affordable devices that are actually order of magnitude cheaper than the stuff that they sell in the U.S. And here's what he found out. His salesmen make more on commission from today's devices than the cost of the frugal engineered product coming in from China. They didn't want to sell it. And so he said, wait, come on, guys, why are you not selling it? He found out why. So he set up an alternative sales force. But those guys didn't have the relationships with the doctors. 
it, they couldn't make it work, right? This is a practical example of internal incentives that even though it's such a good idea, it's often difficult given the internal silos, structures, incentives within your organizations. So if you want to promote this kind of reverse innovation and make it work and really steal that market share, you're going to have to work twice as hard. When I challenged Emelt on this example, he said, we're going to have to change how we pay our salesmen. And, and he, he kind of got it. So disruption is coming to our healthcare system. The only question is, what, is whether the disruptive innovator is going to use forks or chopsticks. So the good news is, uh, eventually, we will get the Thai prosthetics in the United States. The bad news is, thanks to the American healthcare system, they will cost us $20,000. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, and, and we should just, <clears throat> just to finish this thought, it's not just products that are subject to reverse innovation. What Debbie Shetty is doing in India with cardiac care, mm -hmm. radically lower, frankly, better than most of the United States. It, how many people here are in the service business as opposed to product business? Take a look at what Debbie Shetty's done with that. So I know there are questions. People haven't been raising their hands. My request for the mic is uh, we'll call and don't, don't give it to someone until we call on. So are there questions at this point that people are, want to put in? This is really weird. Oh, yeah, the young lady back there. Let's get a mic straight to her. This is such a strange Churchill audience. Only three questions, hands up. We are getting degreed, by the way. Um, I totally totally agree with everything you're talking about, totally on board with globalization. Um, I think, a little bit louder, please. Oh, yeah. Thank I said, basically, I totally am in favor of globalization. I think it's amazing, and people don't really realize how we have escalated um, ideas and standards of living. Having said that, my concern, one of my concerns here in the Valley and in the U.S., in general, possibly globally, we're not investing in basic science. And if you look at the U.S., we've been living off of our space race for many years now. In fact, I'd make a case that the Valley came out of the space race. But we're not doing that anymore. So that, to me, is, and I'm not really sure, I know China is building a UC system at an amazing rate, but is anybody truly investing at this point? I don't see it. That's what makes me nervous. I mean, I, you know what I think. I was at Capitol Hill making the case for increasing America's investment in R&D, uh, both public and private sector. As a share of GDP, our R&D investments have actually gone down, which is atrocious in, a, in an age that we live in. So I, I think you're on to an important point. Um, you know, my argument about you know, uh, innovation not being a zero-sum game, I think the way to think about it is you know, China's rise can be a, a rising tide that lifts many boats, but not if you don't patch the holes in your vessel first. And one of the holes in our vessel is our, uh, in my view, underinvestment in, in important areas that would ultimately be the pipe, filling the pipeline for future innovation. Uh, I wouldn't confuse that, though, with saying that government investment is going to solve the problems. Let's remember the Soviets invested a huge amount in science. They actually had great science, but virtually no value-creating innovation came out of it. So I think the harder part is not the government spending from the top, which is right if done properly. It's that innovation ecosystem, uh, which is much harder to get. As Again, we've gotten it right in Silicon Valley, mostly serendipitously. I think most of us would agree. And that's why it's been so hard to replicate Silicon Valley around the world. And dozens, if not hundreds, of attempts have been made. Every single one has failed. Uh, and so I think the harder part is to get that ecosystem right. Well, I always think of the, the reason why they've failed. I mean, any time I see any area that has an adjective in front of its name that, you know, is, the, is, is silicon right. or similar, you know, silicon fan, silicon prairie, you know, Picasso put it nicely when he said, the first man to compare his lover's lips to a rose was quite possibly a genius. But every man thereafter to make the comparison was most certainly an idiot. <laughs> you know, that, it, the whole idea, it, 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 is, it is inane to say, we're going to succeed by copying Silicon Valley. Right. But her question really is, has got a poignant angle to it. I mean, Laura Tyson observed that half of, you know, fundamental research is funded by the Pentagon in this country today. And there is no scenario under which the Pentagon's budget is not going to drop. And meanwhile, we're slashing and burning our university mm -hmm. budgets. And, and, and it's, it's, I agree, it's, it's a network. Uh, you've got to be able to use it. Don't make the Russians' mistake. But if there's nothing being created at the bottom, else. Let's, let's go to another question. There's a mic right back there. Um, as a recent transplant 
uh, to Silicon Valley, I kind of sense a, uh, an insularity to the thinking and an insularity to the culture uh, that I think is a detriment to it. Uh, for example, just hypothetically, uh, if I were to come in with an idea for a new tire that would last the lifetime of the car, I think I would have a difficult time with the venture capitalists in getting funding for that because uh, it's real risk. Uh, you don't know what's going to happen to it. It doesn't have the glamour of a new app uh, that can be sold uh, in, in, multiple, uh, uh, in, in multiple quantities very quickly. Uh, is this a limiting factor on uh, the valley? Is what I sense a reality? Or is, uh, is it just my imagination? Well, I, I, I'll give you my opinion, but I, I'd actually be interested in hearing uh, a show of hands. I mean, we have a group of um, uh, leading thinkers and doers here. How many of you share um, at least some of the concern just expressed that uh, venture capital and other investors might be risk averse, the area is too insular? Um, hands up high, please. OK, and, and uh, how many of you don't think that? How many of you think that's not how you see things? OK, it's a little bit more in support of your view, but not, um, I think most people are sitting on the fence on this one. Oh, no, no. VCs are, I mean, as, as someone who's been in this valley for several decades, they're, they're sheep. Yeah. It's pathetic. Um, and he's right. But we, and, and, and this isn't the only model. This isn't the only place to get funding. And there are other uh, alternatives. You know, the, we're seeing super angels, and uh, the other models are coming in to take risks. But I think you, know, you put your finger on something really important and that's something I spend a lot of time thinking about and arguing in this book is, um, if, you know, I have said we need to be much more ambitious in this age, in part because the problems are bigger. Some of them are, have irreversible consequences, as with climate or, um, in a, I think, in terms of political consequences, the middle class squeeze and what to do about it. Educational systems that are entirely out of alignment with the needs of the ideas economy. These are incredibly difficult problems that need us to be, take more risks. But when you take more risks, to Paul's point, you have to fail more often. You have the culture, even though there's a, a wonderful culture talking about failure in Silicon Valley. Um, do we have the culture? Um, I don't think government should pick technology winners, but one mistake like Solyndra, and think about how risk averse our government has become, right? So how do we be more ambitious if we are in, in unwilling to tolerate failure? I think that's a challenge not only for Silicon Valley, but for all of us across the country as we think about it. And so I, I offer some ideas on how to do it, but I sure. think it really has to start from the bottom up. So just a question on greed. Um, I'm in favor of it. Oh, I, I'm all for it. Um, and I don't even work at Oracle. But uh, uh, I, one, one way, I mean, it's about creating incentives. And prizes at the moment are, you know, ever since the first DARPA grand challenge, prizes have become the big way to incent people. Uh, are we overdoing the prize thing? No, I think we're underdoing the prize thing. Uh, I think we should have prizes aplenty for everything. But let's not forget, it's only one tool in the toolkit. This it's worries me. At the rate things are going, it means, you know, like in Silicon Valley, there is no car in Silicon Valley that doesn't have the bumper sticker saying, my student was an honor student. Actually, there was one bumper sticker. I put it on my site. It said, my student wasn't an honor student at... Uh, or uh, my, my student wasn't an honor student at, and I think it was Crystal Springs School, and then beneath it said, my parents are a little disappointed. Uh, <laughs> okay, so you think, so what would be... So listen, there was an era when prizes were much more common, and there's a, a, a rich and, and, and well-documented literature of them actually working. Yes. Uh, I mean, we, I think in this room, people would know not only the longitude... Do prizes prize, really create innovation? I think they do. I think they do. But, but the, my point, though, is I'll get to the punchline of this quickly, that is, they're only one tool in the toolkit. But it's a tool we've neglected to use in the last 50 to 100 years, and especially where prizes have become um, after-the-fact awards, like the Nobel Prize. I mean, T.S. Eliot famously remarked after getting his Nobel Prize that, you know, they've just given me a ticket to my grave because no one has ever done anything useful after getting a Nobel Prize, right? So what's the point of these after-the-fact prizes? You should give prizes, uh, including in novel areas like public health, where um, uh, the British government and several others have joined to give a multi-billion dollar prize known as the advanced market commitment, where they get over the incentive problem uh, that pharma companies have no incentive whatsoever to develop drugs for the neglected diseases of the third world, 
even though those are the ones that kill the most people by far, right? And so by dangling that carrot, only if they come up with a successful vaccine, let's say, and get it to market and get it to people, then they can get the multi-billion dollar prize. That to me is, the really, is a much smarter use of both taxpayer money in that instance, but also results-oriented way of using incentives. I mean, when I talk about greed, I, I, wanna, uh, I think actually we need more capitalism, not less, in an era of Occupy Wall Street and bashing um, uh, capitalism. But I, I want a better kind of capitalism, one where we go from greed is good to greed for good. And that's really, I think, the solutions will come from the bottom up, but we need to harness that with better incentives. Prizes are one way to do that. Fair enough. There's a question over here. Yeah, a question and a, and a comment, I guess, on the, on the last question. <clears throat> My name is John McIntyre, and I run the uh, Startup Accelerator here for Citrix. So we're funding very young, early stage companies. And to the last gentleman's question, can you find a VC on Sand Hill Road to fund a, a, a new tire? Probably not. But there's been an explosion and change in how funding is happening right now. So corporations like Lefts and Angels and Angel Funds are funding all kinds of things that VCs may not have traditionally. So it's a very quick changing landscape. And to that point, my program is a global program. We funded companies in India, uh, multiple places in North America, Europe. And we're looking at China right now. So my question is, I'm a little nervous about funding startups in China because the rules uh, are kind of unknown. So if you have any comments about the startup community in China, I'd be quite interested. I do. You know, the old adage in poker, if you don't know who the chump is, you're the chump. Um, <laughs> in China, you need to be extremely wary about uh, funding startups, just as, it, as in any other dimension of business. Uh, the rules of capitalism look similar to what they look like in the West, but they're not. Uh, and so many is the tale of uh, joint venture partners stealing your IP, of startups getting money, but then, uh, in effect, you know, uh, bilking their uh, unwary foreign investors of various forms of, of value, whether it's trade secrets or, or um, uh, just literally walking off with the money. So I would be very careful. That's not to say don't do it, but whatever level of caution you might use in any other foreign market where you're not that familiar, use 10 times as much, and f use all sorts of um, efforts at doing due diligence, um, including uh, understanding who your partner is, I and mean, that's really what it comes down to. And if you use the rule that, you know, look at uh, basic raw Darwinian uh, notions of, of uh, balance of power, leverage, um, rather than sort of uh, notions of rule of law and trust, you say, um, is there any way for me to get screwed in this situation? And if so, you probably will get screwed. <laughs> and, and it's not seen as a terrible thing. And I, uh, actually, a leading Chinese investor told me this. He said, people misunderstand. They think that, you know, we don't trust foreigners. We don't trust each other either. And so, you know, you, you have to behave in a very cautious way where you make sure you cover yourself. You know not only who you're working with, but who are their allies in government, what, who are their patrons. And you can do money, you can, you, know, you can do business in China, you can make lots of money. You just need to be extremely cautious and careful about how you do it, who you do it with. And there may be deals you need to walk away from. So now that you're the head of the China Bureau for the Economist, and I... And, and I realize you're not quite there yet. You're still hovering in Hong Kong waiting right. for um, all the details. But that makes you an expert on China. So um, is the China middle class a bubble? No, I don't think so. I don't think that the rise of China is a bubble. Uh, and in particular, the middle class, I think um, the political system has tremendous brittleness, right? And so, um, uh, and, and the social media is the X factor. You know, the Weibo, the Chinese Twitter, um, and the genie has been let out of the bottle. And we saw this with uh, the high-speed high rail train crash that happened in the middle of last year. Many of you would have followed that in the news. Uh, even though there was an official ban on reporting, such was the explosion of anger and resentment and photos, frankly, of the officials trying to clean this up by taking the train wreck out of, you know, out of sight before investigating it, that um, the, the, the Chinese blogosphere uh, expressed such anger that even the official media was felt compelled to report on it. I think that's the X factor. I don't think the economic gains are illusory. Sure. And, they're not, and so the middle class is there. It's empowered. The real question is how this will translate into politics. Sure. I mean, it, it seems that the Chinese middle class, predictably, is moving up the Maslowian hierarchy mm -hmm. as they become affluent. So as what they're, they're right. demanding more. They're asking for more democracy. Right. The other, other one that was fascinating is watching the activists who have been stopping and uh, 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 stopping trucks carrying dogs that are being head, headed to the food markets. Mm. 
And you know, now it's about once every two or three weeks. We hear another instance where 150 people have surrounded a truck, demanded the dogs be released to them. And so the question I it leads to another question with China. Um, China clearly is headed towards more democracy. More participation, I'd say. Yes. Uh, to borrow a phrase from the political scientist Joseph Nye, China is headed towards more participation. He put it very nicely recently in that you know, India has solved the participation problem almost too well. It's a very hyperactive democracy. China hasn't figured that out. Especially as people get wealthier, they want to participate. It may not end up being the kind of system that we all in this room might say is democracy uh, that we would like, but it cannot be the way that it is now. Sure. I mean, one could argue India might have a little too much democracy, and China might have a little too little. Way too little. And California clearly <laughs> has too much democracy, uh, you know, given our proposition system. Right. Uh, what makes you most optimistic? About China or more broadly? More broadly. Innovation in general. Yeah, I, I, I would say, I'm, uh, um, as I started with need in my book, as I, I spent a lot of time you know, uh, explaining why we have such difficult problems, um, I don't think it's fair to call me an optimist, but I would say I'm an impatient realist. Uh, I don't think the future is preordained. I think it's possible we'll make bad choices. It's possible that you know, failures in global governance, failures in our domestic politics, are failings as individuals. We might just be too selfish. Uh, to make the choices we need to make. But part of why I wrote the book is, is a bit of a call to arms to say, you know, there is tremendous opportunity in adversity as well. You know, we can build the industries of the future, taming these wicked problems. We can create the jobs, but we need to work harder. And it's not going to be easy moving from, frankly, low-hanging fruit of the last five decades in America, when we not only had a unipolar moment, but we also had the gift of the world's brightest, most enterprising people willing to come, not only study here, but stay here, especially in Silicon Valley, help co-found companies. Now what are we doing? We're telling them after their studies at Berkeley or wherever, go back. You can't stay and start a company. Um, and this is something, what, what do they do? They go back to booming economies and start companies that compete against Americans, right? And so we need to get some of this right. So part of why I'm writing this is to say we can solve these problems, but we need to be more ambitious. We need to be more disruptive. We need to be more democratic in how we do innovation. So last question, what do we have to do to convince you to move to Silicon Valley? Because you're <laughs> clearly one of us. Uh, you know, I, I, I would, would love to- Give me a venture funding. No, no, no. I, I, I think um, the most value I can bring to my friends here uh, is to go roaming around the world, including coming back to Silicon Valley often. So I would be honored to, to come back often, but I think uh, the greatest service I can do is actually to go and ask rude questions to people in power. Uh, who are you know, posing as the, you know, the, the leaders of the world or captains of industry and come back and report back to all of you. Well, thank you. Let's give a hand to Vijay. Thank you. I'd like to thank our speakers once again for delivering this provocative conversation. Vijay's book, Need, Speed, and Greed, is available courtesy of Books, Inc. for purchase in the lobby. Anybody who signs up as a new member today will receive a copy of the book as part of that. Hey. And I'd like to also thank Citrix Systems again for hosting us, and you have been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much for coming. Have a great day. Thank you so much.